Chapter Three. I am the way, the truth, and the life. We have arrived at that place, in our pointing out what is to be met by a traveller on the path to the kingdom, where the voice of love has become the recognised and accepted guide. If you will remember. The traveller has become a disciple on probation. The prodigal is now on his way back to his father's house. After a long period of trials and testing, he has proved that nothing can entice or stop him from his determination to reach that goal. Finally, there comes the supreme test for this period. In some deep soul experience, he is required to make a heart-rending choice between a long-cherished ideal and a plain duty, perhaps. And if duty wins, and it will win, if he turns in prayer for help to this sure guide within, his Christ self. Then he enters a new and brighter stage of the journey, for his dedication has proven to be a soul consecration, not merely one of the mind and the heart, and he is now accepted as and has become a real disciple. From this on, he grows more and more conscious of definite guidance from within. The voice speaks more clearly and insistently. The love in his heart becomes more pronounced, and will not be denied. Gradually, he learns by centering his attention deep within that there a wonderfully wise and loving self exists, one that is ever ready to teach, help, and strengthen when asked. And the voice there, which says with unmistakable authority, "I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me," is the voice of his Christ self, ever speaking from out the heart, when the mind is stilled so that it can be heard. Then it is that the disciple begins definitely to realize that he is not his human mind, with its concerns that has to be stilled and be made to listen, but that in some mystical yet natural way, he is a part of and can actually enter into the consciousness of that Christ self within. And can at will command the mind to be still, and can compel it to obey. And it dawns upon him that while in this consciousness he is the master, but when without in the brain consciousness he is only the disciple. And then he realizes that by opening his heart and letting love pour out. He can at will enter into and be that love, and that in that love consciousness, he and Christ are one. That he is conscious, even as Christ Jesus was conscious. That he is the way, the only way, the only truth, and the only life. That the brain mind is but the self consciousness which he is teaching, training, and disciplining, to be his perfect instrument of expression. And the disciple learns, as the brain mind lets go, stands aside and watches what happens, that all that is ever necessary, when the disciple is called upon to teach or help anyone. Is to open the mouth and begin to speak, and the words are given him to say, or to start to do anything, no matter what, and a wise and loving power puts forth from within and enables him to do it.
Likewise, if he wishes to know anything, he needs only to ask and then to get quiet and absorb the wisdom that pours in and floods his consciousness. Thus the brain-mind slowly and surely is taught its part and place, which is to look up to, wait upon and serve you, abiding now in the consciousness of your Christ Self. When in that consciousness, verily you are the master, and the brain-mind, that which is now reading these words and trying to understand them, has become the humble and loving disciple, or hopes, longs to be such. If you can conceive of what all this means, you can understand that gradually, as the disciple, the human mind, more and more lets the master work through him, the master's consciousness truly becomes his consciousness so that the master is actually living his life in him, doing his will in him, and being his self in him. As a result of this, the human mind as the disciple is now in a position where the master is able through it to do the work he came here to do, and for which all these many years he has been fitting and perfecting the disciple. They now work as one, in perfect harmony with all the other brothers of the kingdom, serving the great cause of brotherhood under the leadership of our Supreme Lord and Master, Jesus Christ. We cannot point you further on the way for this is as far as the human mind can enter in consciousness at this time. Read the above many times. Ponder and meditate over the words as they are written. Something very wonderful may result for you. If not now, you will at least know what awaits if you faithfully follow with us and obey the suggestions given. From the above you can learn that real disciples may always be known by the work they are doing, by the unquestioned good accomplished, by their self-sacrificing service to humanity. They live only to serve, their every thought and interest is for others. For are they not now integral parts of that great brotherhood of servers? who abide in Christ and obey only Him? The Christ Self, the Master within, thus is revealed to those who are worthy to know Him and to become His disciples. All others know Him but as a wondrously kind and helpful friend who is ever seeking to do good to others to anticipate their needs and to assist them in a loving way whenever and wherever possible. Understanding all this, you will note that few as yet have become accepted and therefore are actual disciples. A goodly number are disciples on probation. But there are many who are still aspirants but who, we hope from the quickening received by earnestly following the suggestions given in these pages, will in time consciously reach the disciple stage. For this work is, and these articles are written principally, for disciples. Those who hearts felt and responded to the call Seek ye first the kingdom, actually obey the command of their souls, no matter if their intellects reasoned them away later. All such are disciples in their soul natures, and they remembered and tried to have their personalities also understand. Our part is fully to awaken such 
and to uncover to their brain minds what they in their souls inherently are, so that they may journey back to their father's house, the Christ consciousness, and learn there of the work awaiting them as souls. All those who definitely feel the appeal of these words and deem such as possible for them may know that they are destined for discipleship in this life. May the souls of all who read and who before did not fully understand be so inspired by the truth herein revealed that the Blessed One, the Master within, may this very hour call them forth to follow and serve Him the rest of their days. I am the way. In the preceding chapter, we sought to convey a very great truth, which has become wholly necessary for everyone to know who seeks to enter the kingdom of God. In fact, this truth must be faced and fully acknowledged, must be built into the soul consciousness before one can ever proceed very far on the journey to the kingdom. This truth is that within you is the light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world, that that light is the Christ of God, which shines ever brighter and brighter in the darkness of man's mortal mind as it unfolds in consciousness through the ages and in time turns away from the half-light of human knowledge and experience, in a sole demand for an understanding of the true light which alone will satisfy. That light is the Holy Spirit that shines deep within every man. It speaks from the heart of every earnest seeker, and with no uncertain voice says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Why will men not listen? Even those who yearn for the fullness of life, that they may know the truth and be shown the way. Because they have not yet unfolded to the blossoming stage, the bud of their souls has not yet matured. The love life within has not yet become strong enough to force the covering of self to let go and open, so that the sunlight of the spirit may unite with the light of the soul, and draw forth the fragrance and beauty of the life within. If that is so, then man has nothing to do with this unfolding process, you say. Yes, that is really true. No man can actually hasten the process. No one can truly help another, except by pointing out to the human mind the meaning of that through which a soul is passing, thus causing the mind to quiet down, thereby permitting the life within to develop the petals of the soul to maturity, the time of blossoming. It is the self-seeking mind that seemingly interferes and holds back growth. Yet all the time the mind is serving the purpose of providing a strong, protective sheath, absorbing from without the little light that it can gain from human teachings, just enough to protect it, while the love life within builds up the soul qualities needed for its perfect expression when the blossoming and fruiting seasons arrive. Many very earnest seekers cannot yet accept that which we have been to such pains to explain. They are still so engrossed in acquiring what they call knowledge, and think that so wholly necessary that they may belittle the importance of what has been stated. But that is the John the Baptist stage. 
even as he came to announce and to prepare the world for Jesus the Christ. Read carefully John 1, 6-27. So must the mind be prepared by a true and full intellectual understanding of the meaning of Christ within as love, before the Holy Spirit can descend and quicken the heart, and the Christ Self can stand forth in the consciousness and minister in the Father's name unto all who believe. Those who still think of Christ as embodied only in Jesus, and cannot feel and know Him within their own hearts, may be masters of wisdom, adepts in the use of the law, but if they have not the consciousness of Christ as the love of God in their hearts, they are but as sounding brass and tinkling cymbals. Not long ago there was published in the newspapers the story of a recently discovered 13th century Latin manuscript found in the chapter library of Hereford Cathedral in England. From its style, it is believed to be a portion of the Gospel of St. Peter, which was in use among Christians in the second century. Hear what the three wise men spake unto Joseph, the father of the babe Jesus, whom they came to worship. Do not thou, then, look upon us as ignorant men, but know thou of us, that he to whom thou art appointed as foster father, he is the God of gods, and Lord of all lords, and King over all princes and powers, the God of angels, and of the righteous. It is he that shall rebuke all kings, and rule all nations, with the rod of his name. For unto him belongeth majesty and empire, and he shall break the sting of death, and scatter the power of hell. Him shall kings serve, and all tribes of the earth shall adore him, and him shall every tongue confess, saying, Thou art Christ Jesus, our Deliverer and our Saviour, for thou art God, even the power and the brightness of the Eternal Father. Read carefully again the preceding paragraph, and you will realise that while embodied in Jesus, even as a babe, was very God himself, and that Jesus as Christ is now ruling in spirit as the God of gods, and Lord of all lords, etc. Yet it could not possibly be Jesus, the man, whom kings shall serve, and all tribes of the earth shall adore, and every tongue confess, our Deliverer and Saviour. But that it is Jesus, the Christ or Holy Spirit of God, who is the brightness of the Eternal Father in every man, which shall deliver and save. Let all who still feel the urge to seek from human teachers and masters, learn all that such have to offer, and it may perhaps cause them to hear the voice of the loving teacher within, pointing out what these others and their teachings are not and cannot teach. Repeated experiences of such nature, with their fruits of disillusionment and discouragement, will inevitably bring the aspirant to the place where that voice within can be heard. When that happens, the change begins. The heart, through the distress and unhappiness caused, is quickened, and the master abiding there more and more makes his presence felt. The mind begins to take note, listens, and ponders over what comes through to the consciousness, and in time the light, 
the Holy Spirit illumines it, and the disciple is born. You who are seeking occult teaching and training may perhaps be surprised when told that within these pages are contained more true occult or inner teachings than dozens of such books afford. For these, if persistently followed, will bring results that will cause joy unspeakable to the spiritually unfolding soul instead of suffering and dismay which often result from the practice of the teachings in such books. Personality On our journey to the kingdom, you will learn that you cannot go far with your eyes and mind fixed on the personalities of your fellow travellers. For always will you see in them things that will hold you back, in some mysterious yet very true way, you will be shown by the loving guide within qualities in them that are but reflections of qualities still existing in your own self. This is so because on this journey love leads. And if the human mind and its thoughts are permitted to be distracted by appearances, and are not centred upon seeing the light within your companions, their Christ selves, you will be thus shown everything within yourself that prevents the unfolding of the inner sight and hearing, and you will stay out in the shadows, wondering why you cannot progress as your soul longs to do. It is hard for many to believe that what they see in others is because of what still exists in themselves. But that is only because they are still more interested in judging others than in listening to the loving one within, who always seeks to draw their thoughts to himself, that he may open their hearts so they may feel their his love, and thus may see with his eyes the souls of their fellows, shining in the darkness of mortal consciousness, ever seeking to be free, even as their own souls long to be free. The way to the kingdom is within, where personalities do not exist. On that journey, therefore, they must be left behind. No one may expect to drag personality along and get very far. For the earnest ones, the true disciples of Christ, have speeded on ahead unhampered by the load others are attempting to carry. The disciple is one who has been a prodigal son, one who has travelled in a far country and has wasted his substance in wrong living. But he has gained much experience thereby and with it much knowledge of what the world does not and cannot supply. For with that knowledge has come an understanding heart and a compassion for his fellow men whom he sees wasting their substance and who are still engrossed in the things he now knows to be of no value. And therefore, because of his own former weaknesses, he makes allowance for the weaknesses of his brothers who do not understand, so he does not judge and condemn as he formerly was wont to do, but somehow sees right through the personality, the souls of others who are wandering in the darkness of his own former state, seeking everywhere without for the light that all the time is shining deep in the midst of them, and they do not know it. It is thus that the disciples' inner eyes are opened. Compassion and understanding lift the veil of self and enable him to see through into the souls of his fellows, and thus to know his oneness with them. 
A disciple learns early not to deal with men and women, but with souls. Gradually he becomes more concerned with the effect upon himself than with what others say and do to him. He seeks earnestly to learn what weakness or inharmony in himself drew forth such unkind words or harmful acts that hurt and caused his soul disquiet or trouble. By thus noting such, and asking the loving one within to point out the cause, he gradually learns to avoid and eliminate all such weaknesses and tendencies. Likewise, in dealing with others, it is not so much what the personality says or does, as what the soul is and seeks to be that interests him. Knowing that intrinsically their higher selves are one in Christ, and that therefore their purpose is one, that they may come forth and express their real nature, often the conscious disciple will enter into a secret conspiracy with the higher self of the other to foil the other's personality in its every attempt to exercise its lower nature. Such are occasions for real inner growth and unfoldment. If you would be a disciple and would feel the joy of entering into such a conspiracy, seek through the eyes of love to see the soul of your brother, for in it you will see the beloved one, your Christ self, the light which lighteth every man, and he will show you how to foil the selfish, thoughtless self of both you and your brother. Meditation there are probably some who are impatient at what they think to be the slowness of their progress, and who wish to be put to work, evidently not recognizing that very definite work has already been given them to do in the two preceding chapters. Such may not be the work they are looking for. It may seem to them too simple, even unnecessary, not yet glimpsing that the work they later will be called upon to do is mental work and of an extremely difficult kind to those who have not learned to concentrate and to control their thoughts, to shut them off at will, and to direct them upon any desired subject. All such must learn that to be of real service to the Master within they must be able to hear his voice when he speaks, and that cannot be until they have learned to become quiet, and to turn their thoughts within, for the definite purpose of finding and getting acquainted with him. That is plain enough, is it not? We wish to help every earnest seeker to accomplish this, but before that is possible, mind control must be attained. This is only stating in another way what has been told several times already, and it will be repeated again and again until all realize the necessity of regular and systematic meditation. For the twofold purpose of training and discipling the mind until it becomes a perfect instrument for the Master's use, and of learning to find and to know Him. In doing this you will soon realize that you are fulfilling the wishes of your higher self. By His approval shown in the results attained, and you will surely learn who is the Master. Also, you will learn thereby why this is not inconsistent with what was said above about no one being able actually to hasten the process of spiritual growth. The Meditation Exercises For this purpose alone are the definite exercises given you in the Meditation number 2, which will be found 
in the appendix. They are for the use of those only who are no longer seeking anything for self, but that they may fit themselves perfectly for the Master's use. Such are candidates for discipleship, and such are always provided with the help necessary. Should the powers gained be used selfishly, those so misusing them will learn through sorrow and much suffering that the light within has become obscured and spiritual darkness hides the way. Let all heed these words. In trying to grasp the wonderful meaning of your being a center of God's consciousness, see yourself as an idea in his mind. That idea being your Christ self, his beloved son, formed in the Father's image and likeness. The real you is such an idea, a loved concept of your father's mind, and therefore it is ever within that mind and is always open to receive or perceive everything else in that mind. If you can see the sun as the outer symbol to your human mind of your father in heaven, and can realize it as the source of all life, power and light, it will help you to glimpse that great mind within you. For your human mind is a center of that mind, which radiates to every center of itself everything that it is. Even as the sun shines and provides all life, power and light, to all in its universe. Ponder and marvel over this wondrous truth. This will help you to see yourself as a center of light, love and power, always receiving from the eternal source within you the radiant God qualities which they symbolize to your human mind. This being true, all that you need to do is to know this, and by so knowing, you actually connect up your consciousness with your father's consciousness, and thus let any quality you can clearly visualize pour into you and shine. For where God's qualities are, they will shine forth and express themselves. Remember, these instructions are for those who wish to fit themselves for selfless service under the direction of the Christ within. While we call them instructions, yet they are in reality only suggestions that will call forth the actual instructions and guidance from the one within, who is the only authority and teacher for you. He will either approve and amplify or modify what is suggested, or will restrain you until he intends you to follow them, or others better adapted for you. By that time, with the training received in hearing and knowing his voice, you will know that he alone is your teacher, and that he can teach you everything. The Importance of Daily Study These articles are not intended or expected to be interesting or easy reading for the average mind. In fact, they are not addressed to the mind, but to the soul. Of course, they will have to be received through the mind, but the student will find at first it may be a distinct effort to compel the mind to read carefully enough, so that it can be shown the meaning hidden back of the words. When the soul perceives this, it will become deeply interested, and will search carefully for the intended meaning, 
and will require the mind to concentrate upon the reading so that it likewise will understand. This will be a good time to try to note the difference between the mind and the soul. Watch the reactions of the mind to what was stated above while rereading to catch its significance. Then see if you can tell when the soul is leading and when the mind. This knowledge is necessary in order later to know when the master speaks. Later there will be given a clear definition and explanation of what is the soul and its relation to the mind. In the meantime, and in order to prepare the mind so that it can understand, try to grasp as well as you can the distinction between the two and to become acquainted with your own soul. Do not forget that this is inner work, and until you are able to follow us and to do what is told, you cannot get very far in your journey inward to the kingdom. Therefore study earnestly all that is said in each article. Every thought in them is chosen to assist you in finding the master within, that he may help and guide you on your journey. Merely reading them over once or twice will get you nowhere. That, of course, will be the result if they make no appeal to you. If so, this work is not for you. But if they do appeal, and they make you long to be worthy of all they hold forth as possible, you may be sure, if you faithfully do your part as suggested, real joy of accomplishment awaits. Consequently, we cannot stress too strongly the importance of reading an article at least once every day during the month, preferably just before your meditation hour. If you do this, earnestly seeking the full truth of each thought expressed, new meanings will unfold with every reading, and often actual illumination will result. For you are seeking the greatest goal possible for your soul, and all the brothers of the kingdom are lovingly waiting to help you and to send you all the light needed when it is earnestly sought to quicken mind and heart so that you can become one with them in their Christ consciousness and understanding.